Good morning. It's good to see you here today, and if there are any of your visitors, you're especially welcome as we've gathered to worship the Lord. Just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, to say the Presbytery Elders Fellowship meets on Thursday in Baltia Church at 7.30 p.m., when the speaker will be Mr. Ilya Marinov from the European Missionary Fellowship. Christian Aid Week is happening this week coming, and if you'd like to make a donation, you can use the envelopes that have been provided today. If you're a UK taxpayer, you can increase your donation by completing the gift aid form and including it with your contribution. Your gifts this uh, Christian Aid Week will make a big difference to farmers in Malawi as they seek to provide for their families and communities. So thank you in advance for your support. You're all invited to our praise night here in Derrimore next Sunday evening at 7 when our theme will be the blessings of worship. The service will feature songs by the choir, quartet and others I will also be treated uh, to some poetry by Brian Rankin. I will share a short message on the theme and the offering will go towards Christian aid. So please let your friends and neighbours know about this special service and plan to attend this special evening. Uh, an announcement then for all our young people aged 16 and over regarding Impact Teams London Dairy Hub. This is an opportunity to gather with other young people for worship and Bible study led by the Reverend Phil Houston. Go and serve alongside a local congregation in different outreach activities in the community and grow as disciples this summer. Team members will stay at St. Columns Park House from the 29th of July to the 5th of August. For more information, speak to Joanne Gallick. Anyone requiring prayer support is encouraged to leave details of any requests in the box in the vestibule and a member of our prayer team will be sure to follow that up. And then as you go out today, you'll see in the vestibule these leaflets. We have another election coming up, our local council election. And this is a little leaflet to encourage you to consider which candidates are actually pro-life. So have a look at that and maybe that will guide you in the votes you make later in the week. And then finally, Helen Larry has requested that the ladies of the congregation, and that is all the ladies, not just the PW ladies, all the ladies of the congregation are asked to wait behind for a few moments at the close of the service. And that's all by way of announcement. We have come to worship God. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Loving God, as we gather here today, we thank you that you are here by your spirit and we pray lord that you will guide us through this service we thank you that we can come to you in prayer what a wonderful gift to be able to do that we can come to you with our praise and lord we have much to praise you for because you're the god who has created this universe you're the god who has created this world and lord you have created us it amazes us, Lord, that you have created us in your image because we know we fall far short of what you desire for our lives. But we thank you that as we gather here today, our Savior is present by his Spirit, the one who stepped down from the grandeur of heaven, who walked this humble earth for a time and then gave his life on the cross at Calvary. But we thank you, Lord, that the cross became empty because he not only died, but he rose again. The tomb was empty when those who went that first Easter Sunday morning. And then you appeared and you, you spoke to those, Lord, who had longed that you would lead them. And there was great sadness, Lord, on your death. But then when you rose victorious, there was great joy and rejoicing. And we thank you, Lord, that as you plead for us as you intercede for the saints at your Father's right hand. Your love for us remains undiminished. And it's in your wonderful name we have come today to worship you. So we pray, Lord, that in all we do, through our prayers and our praise, that we'll seek to honour you, our Saviour and Redeemer. Amen. We stand to sing our opening praise, hymn number 242, To God Be the Glory.
Boys and girls, this is your time, so come on up to the front and we will have a wee chat together. Loads of space up at the front, come on on up. It's great to see you here today. Is there a few more, is that everybody? Do you want to come up to the front? There's space at the front. Brilliant. That's not often the case now, but today there is loads of space. It's great to see you all. And I want to begin by asking you a question. Did you know that Jesus prayed? Did you know that Jesus prayed? Whenever we read the Bible, there are times whenever Jesus went off to be uh, alone by the hillside, uh, and he talked to his heavenly Father in prayer. And in fact, when you read through the Bible, you discover that Jesus prayed a lot, a lot of times. And in John chapter 17, oh, oh, there's the slide there, brilliant, fantastic. Well, Jesus prayed, and there's one particular prayer that we find in the Bible in John chapter 17, uh, and Jesus prays to his heavenly Father, and this is what he says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. So, we're thinking about that prayer today. And there's something very special about that prayer that we're thinking about. And before we think about that a wee bit more, I'm just wondering if there's anyone here who is good at jigsaw puzzles. Anyone good at jigsaw puzzles? I'm getting, I'm seeing a few hands kind of going up there. Oh, nearly all the hands are up now. Fantastic. And that's exactly what I wanted to hear because I have a jigsaw puzzle for you to do today and I need your help. So I'm just so thankful to Mrs. Caskey for bringing this through from the Sunday school, because I was wondering how we we're going to do this. And um, we might be able to put it up there, will we? No, that's a wee bit too tight. We'll just put it there so that everybody can see. So I'm not sure if there's enough pieces for everybody. How many have we got? We've got eight, and um, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So a couple of you can share and do the puzzle together. So I've got some of this blue tack to help us put up the pieces. So, uh, we'll just give these out at random. Yes, uh, there is another one. And these girls can take that one. And you guys can take one each of those. Okay, so we have different pieces of the puzzle. Now, normally, whenever you're doing a puzzle, you have a picture, don't you? It comes in the box, and there's a picture. So when you get all the pieces out, you set the box there and you can look at the picture and see if you're putting the, the um, pieces in the right place. So it's more, more challenging today because there's no picture and you've got the pieces and we're going to see if you can put it together. So if you want one person come up at the front and see if you can, the, well, the first, I'm going to give you a clue for the first piece. So you want to come up with that one and we'll stick it about there. Okay, so I put a bit of that on there and then you stick it on. Hopefully this is all going to fit together. So press hard. That's it. You got it. Okay, so we have to try and fit the pieces around that. Now, a big clue is there's a blue circle going the whole way around. So we want to find the bottom part of the circle and then up around in the top part of the circle. So let me see. Any ideas where your piece would go? Maggie, do you think that one would go over here somewhere? Yeah, well, we'll put, we'll put a bit of blue tack on the back. And you go and stick it up so that it connects with that bit. Okay? Oh, yes. We're getting somewhere now, aren't we? Brilliant. Press hard. That's it. Fantastic. So we've got a word there, haven't we? One. Okay. And that word occurred a few times in the reading. Jesus' prayer. Any ideas where any of the other pieces would go? Maybe at the side here? Could there be? Obviously, there's going to be words here. Ah. Brilliant. Oscar, oh, you're, you're going to leave it to me? Okay, I'm going to stick that on. That's where you wanted me to put it, isn't it? Yeah, okay, brilliant. Okay, now we have another part of the circle and a word here, don't we? Any ideas? 
Brilliant. You stick that on the back there and then stick it on. Oh, well, isn't that brilliant? VR1. So there's a wee bit more here. So there's a couple other pieces. Yeah, Alexander, you want to stick it on? That's it. You got it. <laughs> that just leaves one piece, doesn't it? Okay, Robin, we just, just, I'll let you stick it on. Put on the final piece. Press hard. That's it. Fantastic. We are one. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Fantastic. And that's what we're thinking about today, the fact that we are one. And this is something that Jesus prayed, that we would be one. What do you think it means to be one? Because each of us is one. So how can we be one? How can we be one? Any ideas? Well, we're together today, aren't we? So we're all one church together. Isn't that right? So we are one. This is what we're thinking about today and how we can be one. Because we're all different. We're all shapes and sizes. We all have different gifts and abilities. And some of you showed, well, all of you showed me today how you, good you are at jigsaw puzzles. And it was probably a, quite a relief that it wasn't one of those really big ones, you know, with 20,000 pieces. That must take forever. I might do a bit of that and then just go, about and for, go away and forget about it. But, you know, whenever Jesus prayed, he prayed that we, his people, would become one. So we're going to do that this morning. We're going to get into a big circle and we are going to be one. So get up and form a circle here at the front, okay? Um, we'll maybe move this out of the way. Set it up there. Create a wee bit more space. So all into a circle. That's it. Okay, fantastic. Brilliant. And there's a few things we want to think about now. God wants us to be one. So we're one whenever we pray. So what do we do whenever we pray? We put our hands together, don't we? And we close our eyes. So we pray, that's the first thing. And then the next thing we do is we celebrate. And when we celebrate, we raise our hands and we shout hooray. We try that, hooray. Brilliant. And the last thing we do is that we care. We care about others. So we're thinking about what makes us one. So I want you to hold your hand, eat, everybody hold your hands and make a big circle. Okay, and then spread out a wee bit. Okay, so oh, watch you don't fall. That's it, you're right on the edge there. So we're going to think about these things that make us one. The first thing is that we pray. So whenever we pray, we talk to God, just as Jesus talked to his heavenly father, God wants us to talk to him and tell us, tell him the things that we're worried about, but also tell him the things that make us happy as well. And whenever we're one, we celebrate. And whenever we celebrate, we raise our hands and we shout hooray. Let's try that. Hooray. Because we have lots to celebrate because God sent his son Jesus into the world to be our savior. And whenever we meet together as one in church every Sunday, we celebrate the fact that God loves us so much. And then finally, we care. We care about each other because God loved us. He wants us to love each other. And what kind of things could we do to show others that we love them, that we care for them? What could you do to help somebody? Give them a present, yes. And you don't have to wait to Christmas or a birthday. You can just sometimes give somebody a gift just to let them know that you care about them. And what else could we do to show people that we care about them? Something else we could do? Give them a hug. And everybody loves a good hug. At least most people love a good hug. So they do. Yeah, and that shows that we care about them. So there's all kinds of ways that we can help others. Because God has loved us, he wants to love those around us. So what I'd like you to do is join your hands together, close your eyes, and I will pray. Loving God, we thank you that you care about us so much and you want us to show your love to each other. So we thank you that you have brought us together as one because that's what Jesus wanted, for us to be united in our faith in you. So help us to believe in you, to trust in you each day, and find ways of loving those around us so that others will come to know your love as well. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen. Okay, well done. We're going to sing your song before uh, the children go out to Children's Church. And I'm going to dash up here uh, to where my order is. So we're going to sing Bind Us Together, which is the perfect song for today's theme. And then the children will go out to Children's Church.
Uh, one additional uh, announcement today is uh, that the committee meet briefly after the close of the service. Your offering will now be received. join in prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together as your people and to present this offering as an expression of our gratitude to you for who you are, for all you mean to us. We pray, Father, you would take what we have given and use it for the extension of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Amen. Our scripture reading today is found in the New Testament book of Acts, and I'm reading from Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, commencing at verse 42. This is the word of God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. going to take some time now to remember those in need in prayer so let's join together in prayer father god as we bring before you the needs of others we think of those who are suffering due to ill health we pray for those who are in hospital those recovering after a medical procedure and those receiving ongoing treatment asking that they would experience healing of mind body and spirit we thank you for the skills and commitment of medical staff who strive to aid the healing process. May they know you're enabling as they carry out their daily tasks. We remember in prayer those connected with their congregation who reside in a care home. May they know your presence with them, especially at times of loneliness, and grant those who care for them wisdom, compassion, and patience as they administer care through each day and night. In our prayers, we bring before you those in our congregation who have known bereavement in recent days and ask that you would bring the comfort and peace they need at this difficult time. Thinking of people in need in other parts of the world, we want to pray for Christian Aid Week, which serves to highlight the plight of those in poorer countries and encourage an appropriate response. With soaring costs affecting people all over the world, this is an opportunity for us to show a compassionate response to those in the greatest need. Christian Aid reports that families in Malawi are paying the price of the current global crisis with food, fuel, fertilizer, and school fees doubling in price in the last 12 months. Hardworking farmers are seeing their harvests fail as the climate crisis brings increasingly erratic weather. In addition, the impact of the recent cyclone Freddy in Malawi has been devastating. Floods have washed away crops. Over half a million people have been displaced and hundreds have lost their lives. So Lord, recognizing the need of support for the people in Malawi who have suffered so much, may our concern be seen in generosity during this week of collection for Christian aid. 
And we pray that our contributions, along with that of others, will go a long way to helping families rebuild their lives and give them hope for the future. With the first council elections in four years taking place this coming week, we ask for wisdom when casting our votes. And we pray that those elected will carry out their responsibilities with diligence and a real concern for the council areas they serve in the coming term of office. In our prayers today, we also remember young people preparing for exams. May they be enabled to focus on their studies and at the same time look after themselves mentally and physically so that they get the right balance during this challenging time in their lives. And finally, we pray for ourselves as we continue in worship and take time to hear your word for us today. May we be receptive to it and unable to apply it to our lives so that we may be blessed and be a blessing to others. For it's in our Saviour's name we ask all these things. Amen. We stand again to praise God this time in the words of the hymn, O Church, Arise.
On the 23rd of June 2016, the EU referendum, or Brexit referendum as it became known, took place with 51.9% of the votes being in favour of the UK leaving the European Union. The UK's independence from the EU was granted on the 31st of January 2020, and three years on, the wrangling about the rights and wrongs of Brexit continue. Now, just imagine if our churches were to hold a referendum on independence. And the question was this, should Christians live independently from each other? I wonder how you'd respond. Would you be in the yes camp or would you be in the no camp? The English poet and cleric John Donne famously wrote, no man is an island. And if this is true of the human race in general, it's especially true of the believers who make up the body of Christ. Those who were members of the first century church knew the value of meeting together. And at the end of Acts chapter 2, we find an account of what life was like for these early believers. As they met together, we're told that they hungered for God's word. They looked for fellowship. They shared communion. They were devoted to prayer. They worshipped together. And they had a positive influence on those around them. These six aspects of church life are all important. And over recent weeks, we've looked at the importance of two of them, namely prayer and the Bible. But today, I want us to turn our attention to fellowship. <clears throat> in, in, the churches, in churches today, there are folk who believe that if they get to the Sunday service, they've met the weekly requirements of being a Christian. In the words of the American pastor and author, Tony Evans, they showed up, the preacher showed up, God showed up, and everyone went home happy. But people who think and act like that have misunderstood what church, what the church and faith is really all about. Being a Christian means far more than going to church services or listening to sermons. The problem with such an approach, according to Evans, is that proclamation without fellowship leads to dead orthodoxy. It is truth with no life. On the other hand, fellowship without the proclamation of the truth leads to empty sentiment sentimentalism. This is touchy-feely religion with nothing to touch or feel. Some folk may claim that their church preaches the word and others may respond by saying that their church loves people. Evans contends that if a church can't say it does both, then it's a lopsided congregation. The reality is that when you become a part of God's family, the church, you inherit a whole collection of brothers and sisters. Being married will give you an insight into what this may look like. When you get married, you didn't just marry your spouse, you married his or her family and inherited a whole bunch of in-laws, which is, I suppose is better than a whole bunch of outlaws. The point is this, the in-laws came with the deal. And it's the same when it comes to being part of the church. When you become a member of God's family, you inherit a multitude of siblings. And just as we may struggle to get on with some of our in-laws, we can struggle with some of the folk who make up the body of Christ. That's the reality. We're all different. Different personalities, different backgrounds, different temperaments, different attitudes. And, should it, and so it should be no surprise that we don't always see eye to eye with our Christian brothers and sisters. The world is full of fake stuff. From fake eyelashes to fake clothes, watches, perfume, medicine, jewelry, and smartphones, there's a plethora of counterfeit goods available via the internet. And most of these fake items originate from China, where tourists can actually visit markets, such as the Silk Street Market in Beijing, and pick up cheap counterfeit designer brand clothing. Now, we can perhaps understand why folk may be quite happy to pay less for something that looks as good as their original item. But looks can be deceiving. And ultimately, most of those who have succumbed to the chance of acquiring a cheap copy of a popular item will pay the price. Yes, they will have paid less than the normal price for the item. But when it wears out or fails, and there's no warranty, and no one's interested in replacing it, they'll realize just how foolish it was 
to have wasted their money on that item. When it comes to having fellowship within the church community, it's important that we know what real fellowship looks like so that we can be sure that the time we give to it is wisely invested. Unfortunately, there are some misconceptions about fellowship. The most common mistake is to equate fellowship with a social activity. For example, folk will say to each other, why don't you come over to my house and we'll have some food and fellowship, which often means come over for a chat and we'll have something to eat. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with meeting up with others and having a bite to eat. But when we refer to fellowship in that way, we're in danger of missing its true significance. Meetings with, meeting with others socially is friendship. And that's good. That's what we crave and that's what we enjoy. But fellowship is more than friendship. If we don't know what fellowship is and settle for something less, we will suffer in our walk with God and with his family, of which we're a part. To benefit from the fellowship that God desires for us, we need to be sure that what we're experiencing isn't counterfeit, but it's actually the real thing. To be sure that we have what's to be sure that what we have is genuine, we need to look at what the Bible has to say on the subject. And there, in the original Greek version, we find the word panonia, which is translated fellowship. Panonia basically means that which is common. So to have fellowship is to have something in common, to enjoy a shared relationship. And this was one of the characteristics of the early church that we read of here in Acts 2. And we're told all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone who was in need. And there's two words that we should take note of here, and they are together and common. And we find something similar uh, a couple of chapters later where we read, all the believers were one in heart and mind, no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the seals and put it at the apostles' feet. And that's in Acts chapter 4. The way these believers operated as a fellowship ensured that everyone was provided for. And referring to these verses, Evans says, there were no welfare programs or government grants in Jerusalem, just canonia of the church. When any Christian had a need, it was covered by the family of God because they, they cared and they were prepared to share. Now, such a fellowship has four aspects to it, and these are found among the, the one another expressions we see scattered throughout the New Testament. The first expression is found in John chapter 13. And there we see Jesus saying to his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Another classic passage on the subject of love is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul says that no matter what you do in the way of Christian service or sacrifice, even giving your life, if you don't have love, Everything else is a waste of time, he says. Now, love, unfortunately, has been devalued by the way it's been viewed and portrayed by much of contemporary society. So that today, expressions of love vary from our appreciation of certain foods to how much we support our favorite sports team. Love, in a biblical sense, however, is not so much about emotion as the intention to help others. And such love is at the very heart of true fellowship. Every husband knows that it's not enough to say to his wife, I love you, honey. She must see it acted out for it to be authentic. And love certainly can be expressed in words, but words alone are not enough. When a couple are in the process of trying to restore their marriage, the question during the counseling must be, what are you going to do? If a solution doesn't work itself down to that level, then really it's not authentic. Our words need to be matched by our actions. James, in his letter, writes, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? True, authentic, 
biblical fellowship is characterized by love, which is seen in our actions. If we're not doing anything to help our fellow Christians who are in need, it doesn't matter how many Sundays we go to church, we're not really living in fellowship the way God wants us to. The second one another relates to Paul's command in Galatians 5, where he says, serve one another. And there are many examples of servanthood in the Bible, but none greater than that of Jesus himself. John, in chapter 13 of his gospel, tells us that as Jesus met with his disciples for the Last Supper, the disciples were arguing over who was the most important. And so the last thing in their mind would have been washing each other's feet. But without a word, Jesus picked up a basin and a towel and began washing their feet. And here we see the Son of God, God in the flesh, serving others by carrying out the most menial of tasks. I wonder, when was the last time you or I picked up a towel or did whatever we had to to serve someone in need? Jesus demonstrated that true fellowship involves serving each other without waiting to be told. No one asked him to pick up the towel and wash the disciples' feet. He took the initiative, and in so doing, he set us an example to follow. So we're to love one another, and we're to serve one another. The third expression that helps us understand the true nature of fellowship is found in Galatians chapter 6. And this is a tough one, because it involves restoring a brother or sister who has drifted away from God or failed him in some way. Writing about this, Paul says, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, for you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now there are a number of ways a Christian can be involved in restoring others. That might be that someone has been, as Paul puts it, caught in a sin. And the, the word restore here means to mend a broken net or set a broken bone. Now, if you can imagine um, a bear or some other animal getting caught in a trap, the animal didn't intend to get caught, of course. It just walked into the trap and got snared. And it's a bit like that sometimes when someone gets caught in a sin. They may not have intended to sin, but through their actions, they've been overtaken by it and caught in its trap. And just like a trapped animal, they need someone to free them and mend the broken bone. Sadly, when faced with this situation, some Christians choose to gossip rather than help the person out of the trap. But Paul makes it very clear that it's not our role to criticize or talk about the person's failure, but rather do something to help them. When a fellow believer is caught in a sin, the church that is practicing authentic fellowship will rush to the rescue. As someone has put it, the church is not a firing squad. We are healers who mend broken bones. So we're to love one another, we're to serve one another, and we're to restore one another. The fourth and final expression regarding true fellowship is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, where Paul writes, encourage one another and build each other up. The goal of encouragement is to build other Christians up. Why? Well, because they've been knocked down. And then there are limitless number of reasons why a Christian may be feeling completely floored. It may be circumstances or some kind of failure spiritually. But it's not our job to knock them down further. Our job is to encourage them and help them back up. How do we do that? Well, we need to know more of what God says in his word. Because the more we know of him and his ways, the better we will be prepared to help those who need encouragement. You see, reading the Bible isn't just for ourselves. It's for the benefit of those around us. Because when we know God better and we know what his word says, we're better equipped to help those in need. In the words of Paul to the believers in Rome, we should be competent to instruct one another. There are certain ingredients, some of which are secret, that go together to give Coca-Cola its distinctive taste. And over the years, there have been many attempts to copy this popular soft drink. But without the special ingredients, its imitators are doomed to failure. And when it comes to fellowship, without the right ingredients, 
what we experience will be a very poor imitation. Today, God has reminded us through his word of the ingredients that go together to produce true fellowship, the willingness to love one another, serve one another, restore one another, and encourage one another. With God's help, if we incorporate these ingredients into the way we treat each other, our fellowship will be the real thing. A canonia where God's people share and care for each other. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have called us together as your people. And as we meet together today, we come together in fellowship. Not because of any particular things we would say or do, but because we are yours. You have called us into fellowship with you and with each other. And whenever we look at the cross, we can see that. Because in the vertical mem member of the cross, we can see that vertical relationship with us and you. And as we look at the, the other, the horizontal members of the cross, then we see arms reaching out to those around us. And just as you reached out in the cross to the world, you call us to reach out to each other with your love and your grace. <coughs> Father, we thank you that as a fellowship, we are, we are seeking to put your word into practice. We are seeking to love each other and serve each other. We are wanting to restore others who have fallen away. And we do seek to encourage each other. So enable us to keep doing that, that we might truly honor you as a true fellowship of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And our final hymn picks up on that theme of helping each other. So let's stand and sing hymn number 594, Help Us to Help Each Other, Lord.
close with the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.